My name is Angelica Valdez, and I will be your moderator for this session. Um, before we begin, we wish to inform you that this session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. So please modify your name and or shut off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. We ask that all attendees keep their audio off until the audience led question and answer period at the end of the session. And I will let you know when that is. Thank you. Um, this is a career talk for food and nutrition policies and programs, which is the title of one of the master's and doctoral degrees offered by the Friedman School. This career talk invites researchers, health professionals, and Tufts alumni from private and public sectors to discuss career opportunities related to food and nutrition policies and programs. Our esteemed guests will give us a brief introduction of themselves and their backgrounds. Then I will ask a few questions. And finally, we'll have some questions from the audience. We look forward to plenty of questions from all participants. The chat will be open for questions and comments. I will be monitoring the chat. Please feel free to use it during the session, but keep your microphones on mute unless I call on you. All right, well, thank you. Uh, all right, esteemed guests, could you please tell us your name, where you work, what you do, and how you arrived at that position? And we will start with Laura. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll start off by saying uh, thank you for having me. And it's always a pleasure to be able to speak um, and come back to the Friedman community. It was a wonderful experience. I'm always happy to be invited back. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Laura Carroll. I am a senior policy advisor at FDA in our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. My main role is serving as the lead implementation manager for our nutrition initiatives. So I work on a variety of issues ranging from sodium targets to nutrient content claims like healthy and the labeling of plant-based alternatives and standards of identity. Um, I get to do a little bit of subject matter expert work, working on rules and guidances, but I also, a lot of my work is actually strategic development and coordination. So thinking about how our nutrition portfolio and all the policies work together and how they help achieve our broader goals of reducing diet related chronic diseases, um, how we tell our story about the work that we're doing to help build support with internally, um, but also externally with our stakeholders and the Hill. So I entered the federal government in 2013 as a presidential management fellow. And if any of you are interested in federal government, I highly recommend checking out the fellowship. And I am happy to go into more detail about what it entails but it is very high level, a two-year fellowship for postgraduates. So pretty much everybody at Friedman would be eligible. And it is, um, allows you to enter into federal government. You have to go through an application process. But I started um, in 2013 at FDA, working in the Office of Regulatory Affairs, which is like the implementation arm of FDA <laughs> in a very simplistic way. And I was working on some nutrition issues, but it was mainly food safety. Um, I spent a year there and then I went over to USDA as part of the fellowship. You are required to do a detail, which is essentially going to another office temporarily. And so I went to USDA to work on the child nutrition program, specifically the child and adult care food program and summer meals. I liked it so much that I didn't go back to FDA. <laughs> uh, and another benefit of the fellowship. Um, I, my main project there was working on the rule to update the nutrition standards for the child and adult care food program as a result of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. So really cool opportunity. I was there for four years and then love the child nutrition programs. They are incredible. I wanted to have a little bit more experience with food industry. Um, and that is ultimately what brought me back over to FDA in 2018. So I've been here for now about four years. So I'll stop there. <laughs> awesome, perfect timing. So I forgot to mention, but if you could keep your answers to three minutes, that would be great. Okay, so I've got Sarah next. Great, thanks so much. Um, and I'm also really happy to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sarah McClung. I work at an NGO called Helen Keller International. 
Specifically, I'm a technical advisor on a project called USAID Advancing Nutrition, and I work exclusively on the Tanzania activity. So greetings from Dar es Salaam. It's nighttime here um, and it's very hot. Uh, the Tanzania activity is very much a nutrition governance activity. We work directly with our government partners. The offices are the prime minister's office and an entity called the Tanzania Food and Nutrition Center. So we work directly with them. And the project's designed to support the development and the implementation of the National Multisectoral Nutrition Action Plan and its accompanying resource mobilization strategy. I've been here for almost two years um, and I joined from actually a global team of the same project, Advancing Nutrition. And that was with an organization called Jon Snow Inc or JSI. Um, and before that, I was with JSI on the predecessor project, which was called the Strengthening Partnerships Results and in Innovations Nutrition Globally, or the Spring Project. So these are examples of some of the US government's biggest investments in international nutrition programming. Um, they're very much global projects. And um, my work right now is a really nice example of a, a country specific activity, in this case, Tanzania. Um, I joined the Spring Project right from Friedman, like three weeks after I'd graduated, and I actually got that position through a Friedman alum. Um, so very much like international nutrition programming, um, I'm looking forward to sharing more about that experience with you guys today. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, Farah, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm so happy to be spending a Saturday afternoon with you all. Um, my name is Farah Ahmad and um, I graduated from Friedman um, at the end of 2019, but officially early um, in 2020. And my title is uh, I'm a Mickey Leland International Hunger Fellow. So uh, the fellowship I have right now is uh, managed through the Congressional Hunger Center, but they place um, the cohort at different um, NGOs. So I am uh, placed at Mercy Corps um, at the DC office this year. Um, and how did I get here? So prior to um, joining Friedman, I was working at Rise Against Hunger as a community engagement uh, coordinator, which is an organization that essentially does international development, but they, they do like the meal packaging um, here in the US. Um, so I was working like very much on the ground with vo like uh, volunteers here domestically. And um, I, I was interested in international development. I saw myself um, being in the field. So at Friedman, I had, um, and my internship was at the USDA FAS with the McGovern Dole Food for Education program specifically. And my supervisor there, told me about the program that I have right now, or, or like that's how I've heard about it. And um, during that time, I was talking to a lot of people who were at USAID and um, it always came up that, oh, like working abroad uh, will make you a strong candidate for international development. And for me, honestly, that felt like a barrier at the time. So um, I decided to focus on domestic work. So I held um, internships and, um, positions at uh, domestic organizations like Farmers Markets, Project Bread, um, and a United Way that are doing um, uh, nutrition work either uh, with like SNAP or uh, focusing very locally. Um, yeah, but then, um, I don't know, I decided to pursue this opportunity. And then when I got it, uh, I knew that um, it's something I would regret if I don't pursue it fully and see it through. So um, I decided to go with it and um, I'll, I'll stop here, but obviously happy to answer any questions here or offline. So feel free to reach out if that's something of interest to you. Awesome, Vera, thank you. All right, Joseph. Yes, hi, Joseph Labrera, um, he, him pronouns. Yeah, and I'm super excited and honored to be back at the Friedman School, even if it's just uh, in <laughs> virtual sense. Um, I finished my doctoral studies at Friedman in 2013, spent another year uh, working on a postdoc with my uh, PhD advisor, Park Wilde. Um, uh, so I cut ties with Friedman uh, officially in 2014, so it's been a while. Um, 
I am Director of Research for the Food Assistance Policy Team at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, CBPP is a DC-based um, research and policy institute. We work on you know, federal and state uh, policies that are designed to uh, reduce poverty and inequality. Um, so my team and I focus primarily on the, the large federal nutrition assistance program, SNAP, WIC, and school meals. Um, I was actually at CBPP uh, for five years before heading to Friedman. Um, after Friedman, though, I worked for maybe four years in the federal consulting space, uh, working on uh, contracts for USDA with the Food and Nutrition Service. Uh, some research and evaluation work, uh, just assessing the, the impact of uh, programs like SNAP and WIC, but actually I ended up being pulled into a lot of technical assistance contracts for USDA. And really that was kind of, I wasn't expecting that, but it was really figuring out the nuts and bolts of policy. So working with state agencies to figure out, you know, how they can do better in terms of customer service, making the program more accessible um, when they get applications, making sure it doesn't take them more than the 30 days, which is the, the, the uh, requirement for getting back to people who have expressed the need for um, SNAP. So it was things like sitting in their lobbies and seeing, do people know where they need to go to drop off documents, asking uh, uh, staff, like, how long do you, does your mail, your incoming mail sit in their mail room, um, trying to shore up their processes so that they can kind of turn around and meet regu regulatory requirements on that. Um, that was a lot of travel, a lot of time at, at, on site visits. And uh, I had, a at the time, a three-year-old daughter and my wife was saying, uh, you're spending a lot of time on the road. So um, a vacancy opened up at the Center on Budget again, um, right around when I was looking for a new opportunity. Um, so happy to be back, been back three years. And I'll just say as director of research, I do a lot of things that you are probably doing day to day, a lot of reading, writing, synthesis, translational work. So trying to think about the research that we are generating, research that's coming out uh, uh, in the academic and NGO space and repackaging it for different audiences, for the Hill, for USDA, for national and state advocate partners, state agencies that are implementing these programs and you know, the general, uh, general public. Um, so anyway, I can get into more of the specifics of that in a little bit, but uh, excited to be here. Awesome, thank you all for kicking us off. This is really cool. I love hearing everything that you do. And so now we're gonna flip into the moderator questions and I will ask y'all to keep it to two minutes, please. Um, and we will start with Sarah. The first question is, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Please tell us about the types of tasks that you do. Thanks for the question. Um, I did try to think through a typical day in the life um, in this position. So I mentioned that we work directly with the government and a typical day might start off with a pretty long meeting with one of our government partners. This might be for a brainstorming session or to plan out an agenda for an event or talk through a very specific document or deliverable. And those are often quite long because we get into pretty detailed conversations about the nitty gritty of what the document or the event or whatever it's gonna be. Um, so that might be half of my day. I often have a few hours of writing or I protect some time for writing. I do a fair amount um, directly and in putting into some of those same government documents, but also just reviewing things or um, doing our own internal reporting. Um, and then towards the end of the day, we often ha will have a meeting with our Washington-based colleagues. So I also mentioned it's a global activity. We're in constant coordination and communication with them. So my days often close with um, a call when DC is waking up uh, and to touch base on something specific. Um, so it's that kind of combination, a lot of time in meetings and a fair amount of writing. And I think that's probably um, pretty representative of, of policy work. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, and now Farah, please. Yeah, so um, for the first year of the fellowship, I am placed at the headquarter of Mercy Corps in, um, in DC. Well, actually, sorry, they actually headquartered in uh, Portland, Oregon, but I am in the DC office. And I am uh, part of the US policy and advocacy team. So, um, and I most specifically I work on um, the theme of food security. So um, 
there are a lot of meetings like with the rest of the NGO communities about um, this this time around. It's it's about uh, like upcoming legislations like the Farm Bill reauthorization, um, the Global Food Security Act reauthorization. So just sit on those meetings and um, make sure that our voice is heard. Um, Mercy Corps' voice is heard of what we want to see. Um, also, there's a lot of administrative work, like tapping up the notes, reporting on those meetings, um, following, up, following up with people who are senior at Mercy Corps, like, is this okay? What would you like to see? Um, also, a lot of um, reaching out to Hill staffers to um, ask for meetings and then sitting on, on, on those meetings. Um, yeah, and then Outside of that, there's um, research um, opportunities, like if, for example, with the Ukraine stuff, I was asked to do some research on commodity prices and how do we anticipate uh, that will um, change prices and ac accessibility uh, to those commodities. Um, also um, writing like press releases or petitions um, when needed. Um, yeah, but that, that's what comes to mind. Great, thank you. Joseph. Yeah, thank you. So a, a day in the life. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the Instagrammable version of my calendar, kind of cutting out a lot of the email, reading and writing, uh, you know, reading and writing and responding and sitting in meetings. But um, yeah, so I, so I think uh, as director of research, I am the point person for my team on our in-house research and analysis. So I supervise two of our research analysts who analyze a range of data sets on the programs we work with, as well as food security, uh, working on SNAP administrative data, a number of different census data products, the current population survey, the American Community Survey, uh, during the pandemic, the Household Pulse Survey. So we do a lot of kind of um, uh, tabulations on those. Nothing, nothing fancy, no econometrics, no regressions even. Uh, but just some well thought out tabulations of who's being impacted and um, you know what their interaction with these programs are like. Uh, I do a lot of reading and writing, as I mentioned. I, I work with our analysts and our intern to maintain our Mendeley reference or citation manage, manager reading academic research. So you know, in a given week, I'll probably read you know a handful of academic articles that are coming out that pertain to SNAP, WIC, or school meals, and just trying to figure out, can we use that? How does that um, align, you know, how can that support our advocacy around these, improving these programs? Um, you know, just this week, I was trying to draft a blog on the recent changes to the Thrifty Food Plan, which is the basis for SNAP benefit levels, and uh, trying to connect it to the National Nutrition Month and the emphasis on eating a variety of nutritious foods. So trying to uh, write an accessible version of some of the technical changes that USDA has implemented uh, in that recent change. Uh, communicating with uh, researchers at other institutes uh, at nonprofits and universities, like what are you up to? What are, what's on your horizon in terms of research around SNAP and food insecurity, WIC and uh, nutrition outcomes? Uh, and then I think one of the things that's been growing recently and I'm most excited about is managing our portfolio of research uh, in collaboration with external researchers and consultants. So we, you know, we have limited uh, capacity to do all of the things that we want to do. So we have uh, uh, contracts with. So, for instance, just the past couple of weeks, I was talking to some researchers at Johns Hopkins that focus on SNAP and uh, the disability community and how uh, uh, trying to improve access to SNAP uh, in that community. I am um, working with uh, a consultant to uh, update our research uh, literature review report on the connections of SNAP and health and nutrition outcomes in preparations for debates leading into the upcoming farm bill. Uh, we have a Emerson Hunger Fellow that just started a couple of weeks ago and she's really excited about helping us write a history of SNAP, WIC and school meals from a, with an equity uh, equity focus and to staff that up, I uh, pulled in a researcher who did a doctoral, a recent uh, PhD in history who did their dissertation on the history of SNAP. So we are starting to kick off that research uh, project um, uh, just the past couple of weeks. And then finally, I've been working with uh, uh, some researchers uh, on the impact of changes in SNAP benefit levels and dietary quality. So thinking about, you know, can we measure 
can we simulate the impact of changes in the SNAP benefit level on uh, people's healthy eating index score based on some um, existing data. So um, a lot of exciting, uh, uh, cool stuff. Uh, um, and I, I think what I learned is I like to, I don't like to do the actual research so much as learn from other people and try to repackage it. So that kind of, uh, uh, I, I'm in a good place for that. And then lastly, I'll, I'll mention is uh, I find as I um, find more distance between me and the Freedman School moving in my career, I do a lot more management stuff. So helping with the team budget, helping with recruiting and hiring for my team, fundraising, uh, all of those things that are essential for keeping uh, the team, put, you know, helping the team be able to do the things that we want to do. Thank you so much. That was very thorough. And I totally feel you on trying to translate the Turkey food plan. Hmm, technical stuff. All right. So, Laura. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, there's definitely some themes across all of our daily tasks. There's a lot of meetings um, <laughs> and there's a lot of emails, um, but I, because my work, because I'm overseeing sort of all various nutrition initiatives, which within our center is actually, there are various offices that are responsible for it. So I am doing, I'm meeting a lot with the various offices, the, the leads of the work groups, the subject matter experts um, consistently to stay up to date on what's going on, to talk about strategy of troubleshooting issues that they may be encountering with just research, policy development, making decisions, or uh, it runs the gamut. Um, but I have a lot of meetings, I have a lot of emails, um, but I do get to do a good amount of writing as well. Um, I'm often writing briefing materials in particular. So things that are going to our center of leadership to help them make a decision on a policy, um, writing briefing materials to our commissioner so that they are aware of the issue and understand um, potential policy implications so they can talk about it uh, with other stakeholders in the Hill. I'm writing and reviewing a lot of our communication materials. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're really trying to tell a story here with what we're doing in the nutrition space. And so because I kind of have the 30,000 level, 30,000 foot view of all of our portfolio, I often provide that perspective of how is, when we're talking about this policy, how does that influence how we talk about other policies and paint the sort of big picture for everybody. Um, so I think that's kind of the gist of it. It is, it is writing, it is reviewing documents and editing them on the side with where I get to do a little bit more of the policy hardcore development. Um, I do get to write regulations and guidance documents um, when they start going through clearance. I am helping the teams with responding to comments and resolving issues. So um, it's a gamut. The day is never the same as the last day. <laughs> uh, and in government, you are constantly adapting. So every day is something different. <laughs> Thank you all. It's so exciting to hear what it is that you do. I do hear a lot of uh, meetings and email, um, but I also hear a lot of uh, communications, some strategizing, some analysis, plenty of reading. So, okay, keep my ear out for what it is that we're going to have to do when we move on to working. All right. So what did you consider when you decided to take your current position? I know Joseph talked a little bit about that, but I'd love to hear more from everyone about what you thought about, what factors did you consider, um, values and, and all of that when you decided to uh, arrive at your job. Um, and this time we'll start with Farah. Yeah, sure thing. So um, because, because it was a fellowship, um, I consider obviously like the subject matter of the work, um, I knew it was going to be nutrition and mostly international development. Um, I took into consideration the project um, for the field year. Um, um, I'm supposed to be working on a McGovern Dole uh, program, which is, again, it was my Fried my Friedman internship that I did um, was with that team. Um, and the location, I knew I wanted to be somewhere in Asia and um, potentially DC. Um, and also the, the skills, um, I wanted to get experience like real world, world experience on policy and advocacy. And that was going to be the, um, the policy years focus. Um, so those are the things that I 
um, thought of, thought about. Um, I imagine in the future I would take more things into consideration. Um, but for why, where I am in my career, that those are the things that I thought about. Thanks for your answer. And that's a really fair point is to think about all of you are at different points in your careers. And of course, you're going to be considering different things. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Joseph. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I touched on a little bit of this earlier, but maybe I can talk about why I left the Center on Budget in the first place and ended up at the Friedman School. I was finding um, there was a little bit of disconnect, a little bit of talking around each other between the anti-hunger, anti-poverty community, the public health and nutrition community, the ec economists and public policy community in DC. So I said, you know, I need to go to a place where I can kind of understand what those different uh, disciplines, how they're talking, you know, what they're talking about, what's important to them. And I got that at the Friedman School, um, just, you know, the mix of courses, the interdisciplinary training that I got at the Friedman School was super important to uh, where I am now and the path that I've taken since the Friedman School. Um, I knew leaving my doctoral work, I didn't want to turn around and teach. I felt like, you know, I, I was in there to get some uh, pract sort of practical training, but I wanted to see my, I saw myself coming back to the kind of applied research space. So I really was, had my eye on the economic research service of USDA to do some kind of in-depth uh, uh, studies for the department. Uh, the government hiring process was going a little bit slowly at the time, and I got an offer from a research, a private research firm to do some of the uh, research and evaluation of these programs from uh, as a third party or as a contractor. And so I jumped on that, and I, I really learned a lot about the kind of how to think about a research uh, project as a contractor, and, but also, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit of exposure to the operational side of these programs. I did come back to the center on budget. Ultimately, um, there was some uh, fortunate alignment of uh, a vacancy opening when I was also kind of looking. But what I really like about being at the center on budget is it's an established NGO with a mission that I believe in. Funding is stable, and I can work on issues with a long arc. So you know, we're always going to be working on improving these programs, making them more accessible more uh, customer friendly and more efficient from a, uh, both a household and agency level. Um, while at, in federal contracting, you may you know, work on these programs, but it can change depending on the administration. It can be focused more on improving access one administration and another administration, like how can we crack down on fraud and abuse, right? And so it, it, you're kind of constrained, uh, even though you're working on the programs, I, uh, I felt a little dissatisfaction of being kind of the being yanked around a little bit, at least from a values and <laughs> uh, objectives perspective. So it's good to be back at an NGO that uh, that you know what you're going to be working on, and if your your personal uh, passions align with the mission, uh, that's a good place to be. And then the, lastly, I'll just say, you know, I work on an inter interdisciplinary team, and that's a training that I had at the Friedman School, and it's something we can get into this a little bit later. Just really lean into that when you're trying to market yourself for internships and uh, jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Laura. Thanks. Uh, so just to what Joseph said, yes, there is in federal government, you're the boss <laughs> that oversees the entire government can change every four years. And that does have an influence on your job. Um, I will say that in my four years at FDA, I've been through six commissioners. Um, that's an insane amount. So, um, <laughs> uh, but going to the question at hand here, um, and work, as I mentioned, working on the final, the, the rule to update the nutrition standards for the child and adult care food program. And it was an incredible opportunity. It's really cool to be able to work in a program where you see a direct impact on, with your work. I mean, that program serves millions of children every day. And, um, and so I, I kind of lived and breathed that rule for basically four years. And um, I was totally worth it, but I will say I got to the point where I was, it was the one topic that I worked on and I wanted a little bit more variety. And for people's awareness, you know, the child, and the child nutrition programs were originally designed as anti-hunger programs. They were not necessarily designed originally to for nutritious food. It was, you know, focused on food insecurity, and there's there's 
definitely a shift happening now of focusing on nutrition and security of not just getting food to people, but getting healthy food. Um, so there has been a transition over the last several years to focus more on nutrition in these programs, but because of how they originally built, the vast majority of the staff that are on these programs are not nutritionists or working in a nutrition space. They are working on program integrity, monitoring. Um, there's all these other components to the program that the participants have to adhere to. So there's just, there's a lot of other layers that other people are working on. And so the, the level of growth that would allow me to continue to really focus on nutrition is it wasn't super high, to be honest. Um, so I wanted to do more. And I, as I mentioned before, I wanted to get more into food industry. Obviously, FDA is the primary uh, agency to do that within the federal government. And um, I knew that they were starting to work on some pretty cool nutrition things. Um, I started over there in 2018 when Scott Gottlieb was commissioner. And within a month or two of me joining, they launched a nutrition innovation strategy. Um, really taking a sort of progressive look at how they could evolve their nutrition and labeling policies. And so it was a good timing uh, um, and great opportunity to come over and be at FDA. Sounds very cool. All right. Thank you. It's good to hear about how you decided to do these transitions and like what are the things that you considered. So thank you for sharing that. Sarah, please. I thought this was a really good question. Um, and one thing came to mind right away. And if you're interested in international development, um, it might resonate. So for me, one of the trade-offs in taking this position was thinking through interaction with intended beneficiaries. And I'm coming from before my nutrition life started at Friedman, I worked mostly on agricultural development programs. So the outputs on those are very tangible. It's like seeing crops grow or seeing quality improve. Um, and even with some of the nutrition work I've done in the past, you know, you get to see like kids becoming visibly healthier and you get to see those happy fat babies at the end of a successful program. So when you're doing policy work, a win might look like a document or like an orientation meeting going really well or an important person endorsing something that you've been working on. So those outputs might look very different. And I think it's important to think through what motivates you and what's gonna keep you going and keep, keep you feeling inspired and happy. Um, so that was the trade-off that came to mind right away when I saw this question. Awesome, thank you so much for that consideration. Okay, well, uh, my last question is for all of you, what did you do during your time at Friedman that contributed to where you are now? You sort of touched upon some of those things, but um, more specifically, do you have any advice or suggestions that you wish you would have had when you were at Friedman that you can share with us? Or, you know, just with that backwards vision is 2020 idea, like what do you wish that you had known or what would you like to tell us? And we will start with Joseph. Uh, uh, yes, advice. Well, at least for my role, like the methods class, you know, the, as I've uh, gone through my career, the, the subject matter can change. And sometimes the job that you have ask, will ask you to do, focus on something that's not in your wheelhouse or your um, portfolio. But yeah, all those methods classes, you know, survey methods, econometrics, nutrition science, food policy, and how, you know, statutes, regulations are are formulated and um, move through government. Uh, you know, I go back, I come back to that all the time. Um, uh, so yeah, I think th that's, you know, uh, a big piece of it. I, in terms of advice, I'll say this, enjoy this time learning with peers. I miss that, I miss that. Uh, I know it can be hard, you know, it's overwhelming. You gotta prepare for a research symposium. You gotta study for midterms or finals, crunch on a term paper, but, you still have that element in work, but you don't, you don't have that kind of camaraderie that uh, I, at least for me, you have when you're in grad school. It's a unique moment. And thinking about your career, look around at your classmates, not just the ones that are in your year, look down and look up because that will continue. You'll be collaborating with these people, learning from each other, uh, engaged in policy debates with, uh, with these people, but also I hope to entice you to join the growing uh, ranks of Friedman alum in the DC area because, we are, you know, we rely on each other for um, 
Like I might have a position, like I want people to know about that position, but also I might know someone who's looking for a position and being able to connect people all across the spectrum of food policy. So uh, create those links now um, and reach out to alums. Uh, uh, I try to make myself accessible as much as possible. Um, and I actually, uh, to an earlier question, one of my favorite things on my calendar is actually talking to Friedman students. Um, uh, and then last thing I'll mention, I, you know, this is one thing as you hit the internship and job market, my training at the Friedman School, I don't know if it really, um, it was geared towards pitching my work from a research and ad, um, kind of research perspective. So really talking about research question, data, methods, findings, and limitations. But when you hit the job market, really think about the color commentary on that, okay? Talk about the, the a, a project, a research uh, paper that you're particularly excited about, so you can get excited about it. But, you know, talk about the things that reveal your inquisitive, your entrepreneurial, and your managerial side. Those things are intangibles that, you know, people looking at your resume can kind of glean what you've, uh, kind of the content, but and what made you think of that research question or why were you interested in it? How did you get the data? Was it persistence and bugging an NGO for that data? Or did you go out and collect that data yourself? And also emphasize how you manage the effort. Maybe it was just yourself and keeping on a timeline or you know, rallying your study group or your, your pro project group to, um, to kind of deliver the, the product at the end. Because uh, in work, as I'm, I found out, it's not just what you know, but how you, you know, uh, how you do the work. And uh, people are, employers are looking at, pe at people that not only bring the expertise, you can always go out and find consultants to get that expertise, but they want people on their team that can help make everyone better, perform better. Uh, and, you know, that's keeping morale high, but also staying on, on, on task. So uh, think about pitching, talking about your project and doing that color commentary because uh, that'll get your interviewers excited about what you bring to the table. Thank you. I wrote some of that down. And Laura. Thanks. Uh, so when I was at Freeman, I did the MS MPH program. Uh, so I, we, well, we called it SPAN at the time when I was there um, for the policy side. And of course, Park Wildey's domestic policy course was, incredibly helpful with learning the landscape and really starting to think critically um, about what makes a good policy and an effective one. Um, but when on my the MPH side, I focus on communications and thinking about how you translate policy into understandable communications. And um, it's, you know, it's not all that different than the research side, right, where how do you sometimes talk about a very complicated policy in a simple term. Um, how are you talking about it for the appropriate targeted audience that you are trying to reach? Um, we have a lot of different stakeholders we talk to, so we adapt our messages based off of that. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you know, I do a lot of writing and getting to the point very quickly <laughs> is really important when it comes to briefing materials. A lot of our leadership does not have a lot of time to delve into a lot of the weeds. So it is thinking about exactly what is the key issue and then summarizing it really quickly. So in general, the writing skills, I remember a lot of our exams at Friedman were essays, essay tests, right? Like you get a, a sort of scenario question and you'd have to write it or you were writing papers instead of taking an in-class test. And all of that, those opportunities to hone in your writing skills is huge. Um, advice? Well, I wish I had taken the claims class um, because that's like exactly what I work on right now. <laughs> and I didn't take it. Uh, so if you're interested in that, highly recommend it. Um, too. I mean, just what Joseph was saying, enjoy Friedman. I remember the Wednesday lecture series, you know, it's part of sometimes like a requirement to go, at least it was when I was there, there you had to go to a minimum of them. They, I wish I could still go to those. Um, I remember feeling frustrated by them at, during, during grad school because there was so much else going on, but it is so cool to get the opportunity to hear from people and pr that have great expertise and different perspectives. And so soak it in, enjoy it, 
completely agree also with the networking point that Joseph was making. There's a lot of us um, from Friedman and the federal government, particularly at USDA. There, I can like name like five people at least, um, if not more. Um, maybe any, but know people, keep in touch with them. Then <laughs> uh, we are always happy to connect. Thank you so much. And by the way, the Friedman Speaker Series, the Wednesday seminar that you're mentioning is open to the public. So not just for y'all, you're more than welcome to come and join us, but also everyone else on the call. Yeah. So big plug for that. All right. And um, okay, so we have Sarah. Thanks. Um, th these guys, Joseph and Laura, have made really good points. So I tried to think of if mine are different or um, going in a different direction. So. First, um, you can get such valuable practical experience at Friedman, and I do find myself going back to things I learned in survey research or in monitoring and evaluation. Um, so don't sleep in those classes because you rarely get the time to like dedicate to fully understanding that kind of methodology and, and working on your skills in those areas. So that's one point. Um, there, the networking thing is definitely important, and I would say, extend it to your professors as well. Um, I made a point of staying in touch with some of the professors I really admired and kept up with the work that they were doing. And your paths probably will continue to cross in a professional setting. Um, so just so when you're thinking about networking, extend it to the people that you're learning from as well. Um, and then as far as I guess something that I didn't think about so much when I was a student and I kind of wish I had, and Laura actually kind of touched on it, but it's being able to take complex information or ideas and put it into language that is accessible to anyone or language that anyone can engage with, because oftentimes you're not going to be working, you're going to be the nutritionist in the room. And so you're trying to promote an idea or sell it to people who are not from the nutrition space. Um, I sometimes think of myself as a nutrition communicator, the way that Bill Nye is like a science communicator. Um, so think about if, if you can build up that skill set, because um, that really helps you get jobs. And it's not just in writing, it's like speaking and how you're able to talk about this stuff. Um, so just having a really good command with that nutrition language, I think is something you might consider thinking about as a student. Thanks. Thank you. That's really helpful, especially because so many of us come from other fields, like I'm coming in from uh, economics and other people are coming in from other spaces. So yeah, it is it is important to think about the nutrition aspect. All right, Farah. Yeah, honestly, I just want to echo everyone, everything that's been said so far. Um, you all brought up like amazing points. Um, so I don't think I have much to add. Uh, but I would say personally for me, so I also did the uh, MSMPH program, and um, I think just understanding systems and structures, especially if you're going to be working with underserved communities, like that was huge, um, understanding that, um, and like all, also honestly understanding my own experience as an immigrant who's trying to make it here, and like constantly comparing myself to my peers. Um, but I would say, I think in Park's class, the determinants class, he touches on the social, socio-ecological model a little bit, but also a lot of the public health classes that talk about social determinants of health um, and uh, disparities and things like that. Um, I think that was like the most valuable part of my um, top experience, Friedman and, and the School of Medicine. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you, Farah. That's an awesome point. Yeah, super, super helpful to think about. And sometimes we have to craft those experiences ourselves. So it's good to keep an eye out for those kinds of systems that are going on around us. Okay, so we have our first question from the audience. Um, Helen wants to know, do any of you have observations and insights about the prospects, potential, and challenges for international students to get involved in policy work? So that's our first question. Um, I can jump in. Uh, I, I, I was an international student while I was at the Friedman School. Um, 
And there, yeah, there are definitely hurdles in terms of just the logistics of transitioning from a student, you know, kind of student visa to work visa and all of that. But I'll say that I don't know how, if things have changed in recent years, but um, there's there's just a, a need for motivated, smart people that want to work on policy, regardless of where you're coming from. There's certainly additional hurdles um, just in terms of, you know, immigration rules that uh, I'm happy to talk offline about. Uh, but yeah, like my first job was at the Urban Institute for my undergrad. Uh, you know, I was able to, I guess what I'm saying is there are larger established organizations, even in the NGO space that are, that are willing to work with international students to figure out a way for you to do the work that you, that they need you to do. Um, and that's possible. I found that true. And my, you know, a number of different jobs um, uh, along the way. So don't, you know, don't, you know, there's a lot to be discouraged about perhaps, but uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me offline if you want a little bit more details around that. Awesome, thank you. Feel free to jump in, Laura, Sarah, Farah. I can just um, say one thing, like when I was at Friedman, which is not that long ago, um, I was too worried and focused about like the technical skills and the grades, which is all obviously very important, but something that I think kind of holds me back a little bit or something I wish I had invested more time in is, um, how I how I present myself, how I carry myself um, at those interviews, like Joseph mentioned that earlier a little bit. So I would say if you have the opportunity, like invest in coaching or try to get a mentor while you um, while you're at school, because um, yeah, like I found myself, I was getting all these interviews that I was bombing left and right, and I was like, oh, like maybe like uh, being in school, that was like a good time to practice those um, interview skills or like uh, develop my brand a little bit more. Sorry, this is like <laughs> develop your brand, but it matters. That's awesome, thank you. I can just add quickly, um, I in the question, I assume you mean domestic, like US policy or domestic policy work, but um, in the international space, there's a lot of um, channels or ways that you might and get that you might get involved in another country's nutrition policy. Um, UN is very diverse, as you can imagine, but there are jobs that work um, in the policy space. And like what Joseph mentioned about the different like think tanks or NGOs, um, they do all kinds of work that might be exactly what you're looking for and have a little bit more flexibility around um, supporting people from coming from all over. Awesome. Laura, do you have anything, I don't have to, anything add? else to add? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, does anyone else have any other questions? Our guests are talkative and they're awesome. So please don't feel shy about asking questions. And feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, or maybe I think we provide our, we may have provided our contact information, but I, um, I talk to Friedman students um, frequently, almost every week. So I'm ha happy to do that as you go through your, you know, I've talked to Friedman students when they just started, when they were looking for internships, when they were looking for a job after, uh, and then connecting with them once they place somewhere. Um, uh, so happy to kind of, uh, connect all along your, your journey. We have another question. What do you find the most rewarding in your job? I can, I can start. Um, so government can be really frustrating at times. Um, <laughs> Things take a while um, and the process can feel frustrating at times. Um, but when you get a policy out, it, I mean, it makes it all worth it. Um, we put out in October our sodium reduction targets that impact the entire food supply. And it's, you know, we, we had actually been working on that for, from the beginning of like 10 years. And, um, it's so awesome to be able to know that you worked on a policy that is going to impact 
every single American in the U.S. and get to see it actually in motion um, is really, really cool. Yeah, I definitely um, would agree with what Laura just said. And I add that there's this sustainability piece to it that I find very rewarding that what what I'm working on here, what some of the, the activities you get involved in might be, it's not just a one-off or the provision of like inputs that people use once and then never come back to, it's actually setting up like institutional infrastructure, or, like policy that's gonna be around for several years. So it's not something that's just going to improve someone's life in the short term, but that it, you're thinking about the long term and you're thinking about the sustainability piece, um, which I think is especially relevant in international programming because there isn't always going to be like an, a foreign donor or an international NGO. So I can, um, I do find it very rewarding that I can think about what we're leaving here that will continue to exist and um, be managed by the, the country that's hosting us. Um, for me personally, uh, again, right now I'm focusing on policy and advocacy, which is fairly new and it's only like a one year time period uh, for now, but I think just like being in the room or like the right place, the right time and being part of that conversation, um, I think is very rewarding. Um, obviously the work we all do is um, impacts people's lives. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really good to kind of see what happens. Um, at those meetings. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and just say, you know, an organization like the Center on Budget and Policy Prayers, we try to find the seam to, uh, within, you know, in, in the corners between Hill, the administration, both the federal and state level to try to nudge policymakers uh, towards improving um, these programs. And what I'll say a recent career highlight for me was this recent change to the thrifty food plan, which boosted average SNAP benefits by 27%. That is a, it seemed like a one-off project that I worked with Park on in my first or second year at the Friedman School, studying that. We, he had data from USDA, I said, uh, pulled me into that. Did it. I didn't realize that my uh, 15 years, whatever, five years, 10 years later, I'd be citing that work myself in making the case that this change needed to, needed to happen. And so that, uh, you know, uh, amounts to the largest increase in benefit uh, benefits to SNAP participants in you know over five decades, and so uh, that you know I don't claim credit for that, but to be a part of that was super rewarding. To be a part of uh, building the evidence base around why improvements to the uh, benefits was needed, uh, so that goes back to kind of literature view, but also all the way to the communication side, working on talking points that boil down that research so that. Uh, staffers on the House Ag Committee and Senate Ag Committee could talk to their constituents, to uh, to their peers about why it made, uh, why this change uh, made sense. So uh, that's a recent career highlight and uh, things like that. You don't discount anything that you're learning at school, the connections that you're making at school, because those could um, end up being a, a piece of uh, something that you're working on 10, five, 10 years later. I'm excited to hear you say that. I am now working with Park and fighting your paper. So yeah, good times. I'm so excited about that change too. All right, so we have one final question from Carol and um, we don't have a ton of time, so we will have to stick to a quick minute, but general question about translating policy. So when translating policies to communities, which is something that you've all sort of touched on, which are some of the skills or tips that you suggest or that you already do to not reduce or oversimplify complexities and multi-scale interrelationships between policies? So big question, I know, but as fast as you can think of to answer it. Uh, I'll, I'll start, I guess I'll try. Um, it takes multiple iterations. <laughs> You're not gonna get it on your first draft. Um, often, I work really well with talking through issues with people and having a sounding board. So have other people review what you've written. And we obviously have a lot of subject matter experts. So when I draft something about a policy and I'm trying to keep it really high level, 
you know, I'm always still checking with our subject matter experts to make sure that what I've drafted, nothing's inaccurate in terms of, as you said, over oversimplifying one of the policies or one of some of the research. Um, so it, it's, it's an iterative process. It's a trial and error. Um, it takes a lot of practice. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have like one great tip, but it is, I think it is a lot of it is a collaborative effort with um, with other people, too. Yeah, and to Laura's point, um, I remember um, when I was taking the qualitative research methodology class, I had my sister review my material, which is like completely outside of the nutrition world. And that was very, very helpful to do. I was trying to think of like um, very specific practical answers to this question and two things that might be somewhat helpful. Um, I just worked on this multi-sectoral nutrition action plan and the theory of change part of it was really important. So thinking through like, what are we actually hoping happens and who does what? And like, what are the key like behavior changes, like getting that specific? Um, because from there, it's a little bit easier to think through what is must have information at various levels, because some of the linkages and details are important to make sure are communicated and clear. But in other cases, it's like the, all of that intricacy and those complex details like don't necessarily need to be like communicated to everyone. So having a solid theory of change um, can help you think through that. Yeah, and then I'll add, you know, as Friedman students, you are being trained to like really embrace the nitty gritty, the technical aspects. So certainly I know that you'll be doing the due diligence on that point, but maybe going back to the communications piece, um, it's, you know, like in the work that I do, we get into the nitty gritty of like, how is food insecurity being measured? Is that the six items, is that 18 items, is it the 30 days of a year, all that technical detail, but ultimately, one of the things that you should never forget is the power of the lived experience, people who are experiencing these programs. And there's nothing that changes the tenor of a like a Senate hearing or ag, you know, House hearing than having a SNAP participant or WIC participant there in the midst and talking about that experience. That nuance, you cannot lose that because that has power to, to um, change someone's feelings, someone's mind about something. Facts sometimes are what <laughs> sometimes work, but there's nothing about like hearing the nuance of someone's experience uh, on an intervention or a program that you're working on that can kind of bring it all together. The research you need, you know, you'll do that in preparing, uh, in preparing your study or whatever, but um, the lived experience, the, the human experience of these interventions programs, that's something that, you know, we're not really that good at because we use the kind of um, quantitative data, but um, ultimately, hearing those voices is oh so important in um, some of the work, a lot of the work that we do. Amazing. Thank you so much to all of you and to our audience as well for the fantastic questions. I'm really excited. I feel like I know I got a ton out of these uh, question and answers, um, and I'm sure that our, our audience did as well. So thank you all for your commitment to the Friedman School long after leaving it and um, for offering us uh, all of your advice. Happy to be here. Join us in DC. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, yes. we do have a nice little crew here. <laughs> thank you.